Hello, beautiful tribe. We are back uh, in this month of October to start a series of tribe talks on the theme of um, depression. And I am going to try and add our guest today with Fahad Fatani. And Fahad is, I mean, Fahad is live. It sounds like a rock star. Fahad is live from Saudi Arabia. Oh, it's here. Hello. Hello. I don't know why at every talk, I feel like it's almost a miracle that the guest is on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with technology these days. We have, we're not used to using these things as often as we, you know, growing up and stuff. <laughs> so I'm just so challenged still, I guess. Anyway, so... I was trying to introduce our talk today. You're gonna kick Please go in, ahead. <laughs> you're gonna kick in a series of a few talks on the subject of depression. So I'm welcoming Fahad Fatani, who is a transformational coach and who is like actually joining us from Saudi Arabia. I'm very happy about this actually. So I'm very happy about this. <laughs> Thank you for being part of the tribe. I kind of want to say, first of all, I feel like this time it's worth mentioning that you and I met in the desert on a starry mm -hmm. night. I had the privilege yep. of meeting you and your beautiful wife, Khalia. And we met in the desert in Saudi. And I was kind of, thanks to another Khalia, which I should mention here. And... I had this amazing feeling that my tribe was everywhere. You know, as remote That's a good feeling. Saudi, yeah, it was. You were one big. of those stars that night, if, uh, if, you, if you remember correctly. You were one of those stars that night. And yeah. uh, You're so uh, nice, to, nice to speak to a reflection. We're all reflections of each other, and it's beautiful. And I'm so happy uh with with having you involve me in this beautiful uh tribe talk of yours and i love what you're doing and i support it wholeheartedly and it's, it's, i'm glad that people are talking about these topics because people need to talk about this stuff you know yeah and yeah so we definitely need to and so depression obviously is kind of an obvious isn't it Uh, yeah. Depression, I was looking at statistics uh, before the COVID and the corona, it was about one in 12 people wow. is touched by depression. Now in the UK and in Europe, and I didn't look at the American or Saudi or whatever statistics, and actually they are difficult to find. I'm, I don't want to, to be a kind of, you know, the plot kind of thing, <laughs> but the stats are difficult. Now it's actually one in five people is touched by depression. Someone very close to me was diagnosed about three months ago with um, being bipolar, you know? A young lady in her 30s who is completely functional, with a great, exciting career, and just collapses. And it feels like we keep on hearing just that everywhere and around us. I mean, isolation, disconnection is probably like, you know, part of what depression is yeah. and so I thought that we should talk together because not only you have experienced it yourself but you transform that energy into what you're doing today and yeah. and I think this is crucial and the tribe talks are there exactly for that to give alternative healing and not just hope as if like this is oh I'm going to give you hope but it's more like There are ways. There are ways. Perspective. There are, exactly. So can you, first of all, tell me, because you are a transformational coach yeah. and you were not that all your life, same as me, actually. When we oh. talked about this talk, we thought like, oh my God, we are our... Soul, our, soul, soul twins. <laughs> yeah, our ways are like so similar. Our journeys are so similar. Yeah. So can you tell me a bit about you and where you were? In terms of, of course. you know, yeah. Of course. Um, well, hello, everybody. And hi, Eve. Uh, my name is Fahad Fatani, as Eve mentioned. And also mentioned I'm a transformational coach. 
Uh, in my context, that means that I focus on helping people discover their own mental and emotional superpowers, basically help people uh, level up emotionally and mentally. Uh, there's so much uh, power we can do with the brain. We can speak to the brain in this language to change our story. But that's not how it started. I wasn't always, you know, into coaching or coaching, but I did, uh, I did suffer from severe depression. Uh, for about the first two and a half decades of my life. Um, and it was very de debilitating. It was my whole life. Um, at the time, I believed two things to be true. Uh, I believed the universe was against me somehow. <laughs> and I believed that my mind was against me, that my mind hated me, in fact, at times. Mm. You know, and... Um, I went through several rock bottom moments at that time. I, I was even suicidal at some point. Thankfully, that didn't come through. Um, but it got to a point where, you know, um, I got tired of feeling tired all the time. I got tired of feeling depressed. It was just t tiring me, the concept. I was able to take a step back and look at me being depressed. And it just was too much for, I, like, I was, I wanted it to be done with. I was, I was over it. I was, uh, to quote Ozzy Osbourne, sick and tired of feeling sick and tired, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, I, I one day sat with myself and I said, I want to understand myself. I want to understand my brain. I don't know how to solve this. The universe is against me riddle because that's a big riddle <laughs> for, for me to solve but why not start with my own mind because I believe that something created within me is against me yeah. and I thought that didn't make sense like why, why would something created in me hate me mm -hmm. so I asked myself okay well let me define my mind you know, let's see what my mind is and I asked myself so what seems to be the main purpose of my brain of anyone's mind and upon reflection I thought well it seems to be to protect me physically mm -hmm. and yeah. emotionally, mm -hmm. you know, physically through the millions ways of magical things that the body does to help us survive and, and, and like habituate to things and, and emotionally using my emotions to keep me from, from harm of, of all kinds, physical and, and mental. It just seemed to be all over the place, <laughs> you know, it seemed to get me more and more trouble than it helped me. But that's when my first light bulb moment came up. And I thought, well, let me stop right there because I believe that my brain hates me. But if there was anything out there alive that's main purpose is to protect me, then how could it hate me? And yeah. for the first time in my life, I thought, holy crap, well, my brain doesn't just not hate me. It loves me so, un so unconditionally and is so overprotective of me that it puts me through scenarios thinking it's protecting me. Mm. When in fact, it's keeping me stuck with these patterns. And, and that was just such a light bulb moment. For the first time, I, I saw my brain differently. That, you know, makes I, me, uh, that makes me think of two things. The first part is the Indians, the Hindus say, you are not this mind, you are not this body, right? And, and somehow this means body and mind are tools. And suddenly it feels that in, when I say tools, I mean they are at service of something else. Greater, yeah. Exactly. And, and, and straight up, when you say that, it makes me feel like is depression something stained and marked by the fact that suddenly this mind of ours is no longer here to help us as a tool, but becomes overwhelming. I mean, you know, like being caught into your thoughts. And then mm -hmm. it leads me to the second point of when you say, my, it felt my brain hated me. And my brain hated me is what? It's like judgment, self-criticism. It's being judgmental all the time. It's not being in agreement with oneself. It's like, what is that brain that hates me? It's that second voice, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, that, that took me to another question. Like, so why do I have a part of my mind that's self-critical? Why do I have a part of my mind that, that you know, like that uh, shit talks, either me, myself, or, or life or others? Why do I have that part? And then it goes back to when we were first born, 
we were so small and fragile that uh, we needed overprotection of all kinds. So our brain was in overdrive, giving us fear, using fear at points to help us survive. Because that's where we came from. We came from uh, a people living off the wild where we needed our brains to, to be on high alert of any danger of any kind. And then social dangers became a danger, right? Now, so there's an interesting part of the brain that I, I, uh, I learned about recently, which is called the RAS, or Reticular Activating System. Reticular coming from the word retina. And it's such a weird, weird piece of, uh, of flesh that we have because it seems to its main purpose is to prove our perspective right. Now, <laughs> I'll explain this. The fact that we have a part of our brain, all it does is prove our perspective right. For example, if I think life's unfair, the RAS will light up, send signals to my eyes, and back to my brain to look for all the evidence that it can find to prove to me that life is unfair. Look what happened to me. Look what happened to my friend. Look what ha what's happening over there. Look what's happening over here. The whole world's unfair. We feed our own belief system pretty much. And, That's and again, psychology. yeah. So why do we have this in our heads? Again, when we were out hunting and things, and we had to tell our brains that the world is a dangerous place with predators, with dangers, we needed this system to protect us from threats coming in. But the way social threat, so like the social life has, can be perceived as a threat has increased so much in, through technology, through fear mongering, through all of these things we're learning about conspiracies and, and all these uh, trusted individuals in, from our history and our lifetime turn on, turning out to be something different. Trust has become on such, such short availability. You know what I mean? And it's mm -hmm. so easy for our brains to look for reasons to support a darker perspective. Than, than what is the reality. Now, to by default, yeah. yeah. And, and to me, this is, so knowledge is power, right? Learning about this, learning that there's a part of my brain that'll go with whatever perspective I give it. If I think life's beautiful, it's going to activate. It's, like, it's almost like, yeah, boss, you're right. Look, look how beautiful it is. Look over there. Look over here. Look over there. If I think life is hard, yeah, of course, for sure. So look what happened to that person. Look what happened with you when you tried last time this and that. Right, So when you know that there's a part of your brain, all it does is waiting for you to give it a perspective, waiting for you to give it a sign of what to look for. If I think the world is full of beauty, I will find a lot of beauty. Yeah, I'll find beauty other people might not even notice. Another piece of information that's so empowering is when I realize that every single one of our emotions uh, releases dopamine. Even boredom releases dopamine. Anger releases dopamine. Sadness, anxiety releases dopamine. And the brain, that's one of its languages, reward, right? It loves, loves reward, loves I dopamine, loves serotonin. So we are as crazy as it was back then when I was depressed and I was anxious all the time. It was tough to admit, but I was chemically addicted to being anxious. People who are angry all the time, their brain is getting shot up with dopamine every single time they get angry. And they're like, oh, you seem to like this emotion. I want more. So what's the first step of any addict beating an addiction? Well, self-honesty. You can see people going to Alcoholics Anonymous for 10 years, and the first thing they'll see is, my name is this, and I'm an alcoholic. There's a power to self-honesty, to admit that there's a part of you that doesn't want to change, that your pain has become part of your story, and you don't know who you are without your story. That's it. The story we tell about ourselves, isn't it? And, and we feel like we need a story because without a story, we're not enough. When, in fact, we are so much more than that story. Mm. So in my learnings, I learned that there are about three detrimental identities people attach to their egos. First one is poverty, where you have less than others. I wish I had this. I don't have that. I don't have money. I don't have this. I only have this. I, you know what I mean? Where you're comparing. Where you're busy yeah. comparing what you have with what others have, no matter what their situation is. Mm. Second one is illness. I am my cancer. I am my slip disc. I am my broken leg. I am my injury. I am my disability. I am my laziness. Identifying is the, yeah. And that becomes my identity. That's who I am. And finally, victim. Mm. I am my abuse. 
I am, I am, I am, I am life doing this to me. I am my, my, you know what I mean? Where you feel like you are a victim of anything, whether it's unfairness, whether it's abuse, whether it's this, and that becomes your story. Yeah. And we know because we can't help talking about it. And story is nothing else but identity. I mean, it took me years to understand what the ego, the ego was. You know, we all know what ego is. And then it took me two years of spending time in India to understand what ego was finally. It was just a process of identification. So your Fahad born in Saudi Arabia, I'm Eve born in France, and yet we do meet in the desert and we are brothers and sisters. And we strive for the same things. And the exactly. tribe is there. But yet we've been identified another way. And so in, 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 indeed, The story we, we tell is this identity. And every day in my practice of Ayurveda, I heal people where actually sometimes you wonder if they want to really heal. They come to see you, but do they really want to heal? Because they are so attached to this identity, so attached to this, you know, what the brain is saying pretty much. I am this, this self-criticism, I am that, I am this, I'm that. And so hence what the Hindus say again, you are not this brain, you are not this body. And we see that very clearly when you think that, okay, today I feel very happy and tomorrow I might collapse. You know, my thoughts exactly. change with so much uh, frequency and so quickly. I, can't, I cannot be identified with that. So how, how do we get out of this? So I, I, um, to heal myself, uh, I came up with my own little theory And I'm sorry for using the language, but I'm gonna, it's part of the naming. I call yeah. it the shit diamond theory. <laughs> the shit diamond theory. So I'll explain. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you'll, you you'll start to see why, you start to see why the naming came and why it is why it is. So uh -huh. it's a theory about yourself and your journey towards your authentic self, right? That's what we're looking for. We're looking how to be more our authentic self and more in line with, uh, with who we really are to, to grow out of all of our patterns, I all of that's the only everything, quest, yeah. right? So, so this is a theory related to this. So if you imagine with me a perfect sphere double, covered in paint, you know, any color you like, sorry, uh, any color you like, and you imagine yourself chipping at this sphere and you realize it's a very thin layer. And underneath this layer of paint is shit, poop, crap, and it's everywhere. And you're like, That's a lot of shit. And you dig left, you dig right, you're like, wow, it's just shit everywhere. <laughs> Maybe I should just put some paint on and cover all this shit so people don't see all this shit inside. But if you dig deep, deep, deep enough, in the very center, there is a very perfect, unscathed, spherical diamond. Now I'm going to rewind and explain what each layer is. So the paint layer, that's my wallpaper. That's what I show for the out, out, outer world to see me the way I talk, the opinions I have, the friends I choose, the music I like, the way I dance, the way I walk, the way I sit. My everything. identity. The habits I choose to show. The, well, my identity, right? My and it's a, very, it's, a, it's a very thin layer. Mm -hmm. right? And so the shit layer, the most important layer actually, and I want you to like, listen to how I say this because it's very important. It's who you think you are. Not who you are, who you think you are. And uh, examples I like to use are when I used to get frustrated very easily at anything. You know, everything used to, used to make me snap so easily. And I asked myself a question. What's my first, uh, what, what's one of the first memories I can remember outside of me where I remember this behavior in my life? And I think, well, I remember my mom used to get very frustrated at everything growing up. Mm. Everything used to get her off very easily. So like, okay, maybe that's not part of my original programming. Maybe it's shit I picked up from somewhere. And through the course of life, this RAS system that I have keeps showing me evidence that that's who I am until one day it becomes my identity. I am a frustrated person. Uh -huh. Same thing with my anxiety. If I ask myself the same question, well, my first memory I can remember is of my dad, rest his soul, being anxious all the time. Maybe because my mom was frustrated all the time. Who knows? But the point is it didn't come as my original programming. It was shit I picked up from life and over the course of life, it showed me that that's who I think I am. And it's not to blame whoever's passing on the shit, maybe passed on to them, maybe it was generational shit, maybe it was ancestral shit. Yeah. So that leaves us with a diamond. And the diamond, that's, that's the part of you that the people who love and care about you, love about you. 
Mm. You know, the people, and we already know kind of what that is. We don't usually like to admit nice stuff about ourselves, but we know what parts of us, the people who love us, love about us. And the people who love us, they have this magical ability to accept and ignore the shit. They sometimes remind us that we're not the shit. Whether we listen or not, that's another thing. Yeah. But a lot of people struggle with this question, who is my authentic self? What is, what is my, who, who is the true north? What's, who is my higher self? That's, that's a good indication of who it is. Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to jump in. Yeah. I think I mentioned this at every Tribe Talk now. Uh, I came across Joseph J. Campbell, you know, like the journey of the hero. Yeah, yeah, the hero's and, journey, yeah. And that really makes me think of what you're saying here. You know, it's like the hero starts its journey up like there and it's going to go as a circle like that. And it starts and he's being called, he's being called and he refused the calling and he refuses the calling. And Something then a guy. bad is going <laughs> to happen, right? Yeah. Something really bad is going to happen that's going to force the hero to actually take action towards this new this place where it was always meant to go anywhere oblivious yeah. of us you know this like i feel like i i vision i, I can visualize a, a small red thread that takes us by the waist towards the place where we were always meant to go anywhere and actually the journey is difficult more so because of our own resistance to get involved in it Yet the journey is also a very difficult place and it's a very yeah. difficult place to go because it asks you to strip yourself. By the end, because I'm, I'm going to shorten that because otherwise that would take too long. By the end of the journey, the interesting thing, and Joseph J. Campbell concludes, what's important, is, he says, is to follow your bliss. I mean, hashtag follow your bliss. Right? <laughs> And that's the only thing there is in the end, isn't there? Yeah, yeah so um, I agree with that. And to add to that, so, um, well, let me just close off to answer your question about how do we deal with this, right? How do we deal with this depression? That's why I mentioned the, the, the theory, the shit diamond theory. So what's the point of me explaining these three layers? The idea is, in A, we don't need a wallpaper. Because everyone has shit. Let's not pretend everyone doesn't have shit. It's just part of who we are, you know? But as long as I know the difference between who I am and who I thought I was. And I spend my life, whenever I do notice shit, I'm like, okay, that's not me. And I just brush it off. That's not me either. That's not me either. The more I start seeing my authentic self shine, the more I start identifying with who I really am supposed to be. So, uh, and it all starts with a change of perspective. The perspective yeah. I choose to have is obsessive gratitude. Gratitude, as uh, to me, is one of the most powerful languages of love and understanding in the universe and, and compassion even. Because if you see every single thing as something to be grateful for, even the worst of events have taught you something, have given you some time of resilience, have given you some kind of time for reflection, then phrase like, thank you, everything, makes a lot of sense. And someone once asked me, why did you call your business uh, Happy Every Day? Uh, I started a, a, my own coaching business called Happy Every Day Coaching. And uh, they said, isn't that fake news? Aren't you selling snake oil, you know, promising happy every day when that's not as impossible to achieve? I told them, well, technically it is possible if you switch your perspective. If you take any bad day or challenging day, shall we say, um, it consists of maybe maximum one, two, maybe three things that are actually challenging. They might feel like they're taking over the whole day, week, month, year, but technically they're one, two, three, three things, right? If I pretended I woke up in the morning and I had magical contact lenses on that helped me see every single thing I can be grateful for, I'm actually waking up in the morning. So the breathing that I can do, the fact that I can use my eyes, my senses, the seeing the sky, meeting someone, having a roof over my head. Depending how meticulous I am, I could probably find millions of things. Okay. In that context, if someone asks me, did you have a bad day? It's very difficult for me to say yes, because I know in my heart that there's a million things that happened that were not bad, that were great, that were beautiful, that were amazing. I did yeah. have challenging moments, but definitely not a bad day. It's just like I had, I never had depression until... The year before, actually, when I met you, <laughs> I, I, I was just like, I think I met you in December and from 
September onwards until the COVID started, I suffered from depression. I mean, I isolated myself so much and it was like, it feels because we didn't talk about what depression is, but I think we all, all agree it's really characterized by a disconnection, a disconnection from others and therefore somehow from life because you do not desire anymore. You do not want more. You don't have this, this kind of energy that's going to drive you forward. You don't have... I remember suddenly not having dreams. I couldn't find my dreams anymore. Where, where are they? I could not identify. And if, I feel like if you talk to someone who is depressed, it's like, but you should do this and you should go out and you should have positive thoughts and you should be grateful. And it has to be worked on, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. when you say practicing gratitude, you kind of like, it feels to me that you have to integrate this as a practice, as a routine and show up. 100%. Because because that's where the difficulty is, isn't it? To find this drive to do things, to, to go there. Nothing I said, I'm not saying that anything is easy or I'm saying it's difficult. I'm saying it just takes a will and a way. And when, you, when you're talking about a way, it's difficult to add, you know, especially when you're in a, such a state, right? To add a new routine to your life. You're already struggling with life. You want to add a new routine to help you beat it. It's not an easy task. So what I usually advise is, Think of something that you already have as a continuous routine, something you do every day. Let's say you brush your teeth every night. Well, that's a perfect place to add this new routine. I start off with putting a post-it note on my bathroom mirror. Why my bathroom mirror? Because it proves to me that I am my only enemy and my only savior. Uh, you know, I either choose to see it or I choose to ignore it. And knowing that if I see it and I name, for instance, three things I can be grateful for every day. So when I go to bed, my subconscious will process his gratitude first. Every day I will start getting into the habit slowly. At first it will be difficult, but then I'll start getting the habit slowly of finding more and more things to be grateful for, making my perspective wider and wider to see a bigger scope and a bigger picture. Now, I hinted, uh, I said that uh, about, you know, being your only enemy, and this is a very big key in the journey of, because of, like I said, self-honesty is, is the key, right? To start with self-honesty, to start by admitting that, you are addicted to your problem somehow. Mm. You're addicted to the story. So the, the main motto that drives my life and my decisions is not you are your worst enemy, but that you are your only enemy in life. Phrases like you made me sad, you made me angry, you made me anxious are not true. You made me want to be angry. You made me want to be sad. You made me want to be anxious. Mm. You know what I mean? And when you take that full ownership, I'm thinking, you start... I'm thinking, like, I had a shitty September month, right? A terrible, I don't know if it was uh, this planet retrograde or, like, Libra and whatever. It was my birthday. I fell in love. I was happy. And I was left the day of my birthday by this man I thought I was about to build everything with. WTF. Hashtag WTF. <laughs> <laughs> And suddenly my world collapses and it's like, and it's like the drive is gone and the, yeah. and I'm, and I don't want to fall into the obvious pit in front of me. I'm not going to trip in it. Oh, come on. It's not because that happened that I'm going to go down again. Like, you know, it's too easy. No, but yeah. the sadness, you know, the sadness, am I just an addict to horrendous experiences? No. So I could put it to you in a different way. So this is maybe one of my biggest, biggest learnings in life. Um, that all of our pain and suffering comes from three irrational beliefs only. All of our pain and suffering from the smallest annoyance to the biggest heartbreak. And they are always irrational. And I'll explain. So it all comes from unrealistic expectations we have of ourselves, of life, and of others of ourselves thinking that we should have seen it coming, we should have figured out, we should know better, we shouldn't repeat mistakes, we should, 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 should. Right? And this is start yeah. to approval. And an unrealistic expectation of other people, that other people should get me, that should, they should be able to read my mind. They should be able to see the ego the same way I do, as if I've seen it my whole life. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that loved ones shouldn't repeat mistakes. That someone I cared about shouldn't do a stupid mistake or something that to me seems uncharacteristic. Because yeah. people do things all the time and they change. There's good, there's bad. People switch between them all the time and that's just life. And finally, an unrealistic expectation of life, that life should be fair, that life should be just, life should be hard, that life should be easy. Life is all things. It's all things. It's which direction you choose to follow. And this is tied to comfort. Yeah. COVID was a perfect example of number three. You know, mm. How many of us had plans? How many of us wanted to do things? Had knew exactly what we wanted to do for 2020 or had dreams for 2020 and suddenly a pandemic? Suddenly all of that is on pause. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But that's life. Life has pandemics. I know. Life has it disasters. Is, life has death. Make, this is why I'm going back to compassion. Like, I gave you this example about what just happened to me because somehow I'm, yes, there is sadness and I accept the sadness. And at the same time, I'm also, um, I started to heal the second I started to have compassion for this human being. You know, I realized that he was put in some boarding school at eight years old, that he is an adult with ADHD. And that is, you know, ADHD is like, there is no follow through. There's just absence, you know, and I just realized how this traumatized being was actually trying to comfort, comfort his belief that he's not lovable. I mean, not that I invented it, you know, he would tell me yeah. how his mother doesn't love him and his father never got close to him and whatever. And sometimes you think, okay, is this being just reproducing a situation to feed into his own belief that he is not lovable? And when I start to understand that, suddenly, like, I can be compassionate and yeah, I can have exactly. gratitude for, and I just saw his soul, you know, instead of seeing the identity. With gratitude and compassion, I could see, you know, the perpetrator is just me, right? Yeah, and, yeah you're, and he's also we're our own enemies. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's funny, you know, because you touched on something very important. Nothing in life is personal. Exactly. Nothing in life is personal. When someone does a personal attack, it's not what made them, you choose that attack is not me. It's whatever mm. happened to them, a combination of life, things, their own mind, their own shit layer, the, what, who they believe they are, that made them think that that form of hurt is okay. You know? So when I take things personally, two things happen. A, I become part of the problem because the person who does the action wants a reaction to fuel that ego. And, and if I get hurt, then I am fueling that for them and I'm helping that pattern go on. Right? Mm. And at the same time, I'm making myself a victim, even though technically, technically, I'm not, it's not about me, but I wanted, I wanted it to be about me because I attached that identity of victim to my ego. And I want to look for opportunities to increase that story of victimhood. Exactly. That's liberating just there. It yeah. is all, all of that is liberating because there is so much altruism. There is so much actually brotherhood suddenly with your fellow human being. And I think that it does heal. This is the healing is right there as well. Um, I think like the key word in every single tribe talk, that's me saying, is acceptance. Yeah. It's just this word is just like a, a magical big one. wand. <laughs> it's a big one. You know, acceptance <laughs> coupled with the feeling and the knowing that things are for the best the way they are. But not sab sabotaging oneself is indeed. Um, I just wanted Fahad. I just wanted to go back to Nuha is here. Hello, Nuha, and she was saying a few things that I think can be tied up. Like, first of all, she mentioned the different types of de depression, and I thought I could jump in about Ayurveda. Ayurveda, yeah. you know, has like three constitutions: Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. Vata is air and space, pita is fire, and kapha is earth and water. Depression in general is associated with kapha because mm -hmm. kapha being earth and water, it's heavy. It has the property of like immobility. It's almost like when it's extremely imbalanced, it's paralyzed. And so there is the kapha depression. 
And so Ayurveda would prescribe for this kind of depression, kind of couch potato kind of thing, assorted with sadness, um, yoga, meditation, and physical activity moving, just moving the energy, like just that. And food, that would be, you know, a kapha reducing kind of diet. So far from like milk and sugars and kind of good sugars, like in form of rice and, and spicy food and some certainties. When pita seems to be more like the type of that depression that I think you had, which was marked by anger and frustration. Yeah. And it's yes, almost yes. like in modern psychology, it's almost like very close to, um, to uh, you know, kind of an incline towards bipolarity, actually, yes. in Ayurveda. Maybe, yeah. And the third one, and, and so you count this depression with like walking at night and walking in nature. That's true for the three dosha, yoga, uh, meditation, and bathing in nature is really what balances the three doshas, whatever the, the type of depression. And then vata is anxiety. And vata is complete anxiety. I had also for the first time of my life last week, an anxiety crisis where I actually called my ex-husband. Imagine, I must have been really desperate. <laughs> who is a beautiful human being and came to save me at 11.30 p.m. I just thought I was dying. And he just revealed to me that he had anxiety crisis like every so often. I felt suddenly my mind could not control my body anymore. And my body was acting up by itself. And it's a very Vata kind of like sign of depression it's, it's when you are distracted, go in all direction, no follow through with things and no objective. And there is a pure, like there is a sensitivity in Vata, like, you know, a heartbreak or things like that. There's feeling lonely, the loneliness of Vata. And so for Vata, again, same prescription, but also with the commitment to go and see people once a week at least or three times a week right. to have connection, human connection, to get out of this solitude. I thought, you know, that's the Ayurvedic super beautiful how I, how much Ayurveda, you know, expands yeah. the perspective uh, on these things. Um, it's just the, the communication, just the communication between the body and the mind, uh, the work that Louise Hayes done on herself and helping people yes. with how connecting emotions. Uh, you know, when I started my business at first, it was very difficult financially. So um, it, every time I had that worry, it coincided with my lower back pain. And my, I had a slip disc and it would act up every single time I was worried about uh, money or finances. And every time I switched my perspective to a perspective of trust, and manifesting abundance, suddenly the back pain would go away. Obviously coupled with me looking after my back and thinking about it and being like aware and acknowledging because it's both, right? It's not just a bad uh, back being a signal. They both affect each other. And one thing that's interesting is the concept of the phrase emotional state. A lot of people think the word emotional state is just one thing, but it's two things. Uh, there's uh, the, the emotion is the label that we put on the state. The state, so when I'm angry, my, I, my, my, my fists are clammy, I, I clench more, my, my, my pace, my heartbeat races. Yeah. And the body labels all of that as anger. Anger is not just one thing. Anger is a combination of processes and things happening in the body, a shift in body language and posture. When I am, when I am scared, my breathing will be shallow. I will sweat more, more often. My, my eyes will be more raised. You know what I mean? I will be much more in a hunched and more protective uh, body language. And uh, so, so when, when you realize that your body sends you signals of what state it's about to get into, and you read the signs, like if I see that my fists are starting to clench, I'm starting to get, I know that anger is coming up, the state that I label as anger. So when I reverse my state, I change my body language, I change uh, the way I'm reacting, I'm holding myself, I unclench myself, I take a breath, for instance, a mindful breath, Suddenly, I'm changing the state because from shallow breathing to deep breathing, that's not the same state as fear. Fear is a, is a collection of all those states that make up that emotion. So you can disrupt that state. 
by understanding it, by understanding your body, by communicating with yourself, by understanding your dosha, for instance, and, and how to communicate to the body with a language that, that fits it. I'm, I'm very much a vata person, like from a very, for many different ways. <laughs> when I took the dosha test, it turns out I had a very, very high uh, vata. And this understanding that under- made me understand myself at a much deeper level, understand my own boundaries, shall we say, even mentally and, uh, and things like that, and what situations uh, you know, where, where my body and, and, and mind uh, melding together harmoniously and where they were not. You know, and uh, yeah, I really, I really do appreciate this perspective that Ayurveda gets to add to this. But it's it's uh, it's just wonderful. I I love the combination of knowledge that human humanity and ingenuity has come to, like uh, I uh, the understanding that we have of the different parts of the brain. I appreciate Western med- medicine for that. I appreciate Eastern medicine for the deeper look and the deeper connection between the body and the mind and the soul and all of these and things. And the soul, yeah. And mm-hmm. and and. It's all a union, right? And when you take the whole picture in and you understand it fully, suddenly depression doesn't become something that you're afflicted with, but something that you are afflicting yourself with. It's something that you are actually, you know, have the power to change, have the power I'm, to... I'm smiling because it's, it is key, isn't it? It is key. A lot yeah. of the people who are healed feel that it's just... And whatever the illness, by the way. Oh, it came on me and that's also a, a point that we have to i kind of have to discuss every time we do a tribe talk there is something that's very interesting i think it's the question of understanding that whatever happens to you was not gratuitous it doesn't yeah. just fall from the sky and when you say that to patients or people afflicted by any kind of ailment Immediately, the connection is, oh, so I'm guilty. I'm responsible. You know, this phrase of I'm, I'm my own enemy and, oh, I, it's my fault. And people do fall into depression because they feel they are guilty and they want yeah. it to be their fault. When actually seeing this, seeing this this way is the open door to healing. It's yeah. not a yeah. question of being your fault. It's being responsible to see that you are in control, actually. Yeah, it's changing the question to why is this happening to me, to what is happening and how can I understand it better? And how yeah. I can understand my part in it. What's my part in this? What's my you part know? in this? Yeah. What's my part in this? What, not why, why is this happening to me in every case, even if someone does a personal attack to me. What's my part? Did I trigger that person somehow? Mm. Is, 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 is what they're seeing is a projection of something they see in me. Yeah, you know, or vice versa, a mirror of what they see in me, or it's a projection of something in them. Yeah. You know, when I start seeing the bigger picture, like you said, you start seeing with eyes of compassion. You start seeing the bigger picture of life that we are here to teach each other to be better, to grow, to be more of the diamond. You know, and yeah. and like 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 my beautiful wife in the comments just said, "How is this happening for me?" So that's a beautiful, beautiful addition to add. How is this happening for me? What, what is this adding for to me? Life? What lesson is this bringing to me? Yeah. Because you know, like I said, thank you, everything. There's, you can be grateful for every single situation in your life. I'm even grateful for my depression because it taught me about my resilience. It taught me about my limitations. And it taught me about how my brain worked and how I want it to work. I want to recommend the watching of a film that's currently on the internet only when you sign up and it's called The Wisdom of Trauma and it's again Gabor Maté and Gabor Maté must be an incredible man because he does come back in this tribe talk pretty much every week or months or whatever Amazing. as well just because he sees everything through childhood trauma and I just watched the film yesterday and I have to say, it was quite depressing as well. I mean, it... <laughs> yeah, I'm sure <laughs> the topic is yeah, quite heavy. Yeah, it is in the sense that you feel like shit. It's the whole thing that's depressed, you know. Like we are all traumatized. And, it, and it's all on us. And it's all on us. <laughs> you know, it's all on us. And it's and it's all on us. And what we're doing here, <laughs> Fahad, and with the people watching us, and it's it it is key to turn this thing around. I have never been so affected and aware of what was called and what is called the collective unconscious. 
Yeah. Again, this was an abstraction. And now I feel with this COVID, it's become such a, rea a reality. Even the untold, this like negativity, this kind of depression, this ongoing worry about how we're going to make a living, why our price is rocketing. You know, my, my, my neighbor is dying because she doesn't have a job anymore. And like she can't go to the normal supermarket because price have rocketed to 50%. And, and just like everything seems to be so heavy. The lightness is gone. And how do we retrieve the means to just be, you know, and, and worry free and anxiety free and just be an acceptance and live some simple life which are connected to others. I don't know. This is my dream. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy you're mentioning this, actually. I, I don't know if you noticed I was having a smile and I didn't mean the smile as yes, in I'm appreciating this, but the smile, the smile is because, you know, I, through my work, I learned a few things that really, you know, like really made me think. And the one thing that I noticed from all of my clients, from one that was suicidal to people who were, had depression to, you know, and watching how their story has changed. The one thing that I noticed is the common factor is the language we use with ourselves. The way we talk to ourselves is the main culprit, mm. right? When you think about it, it is, it's always been the way you talk to yourself, the way you talk to yourself about yourself, about other people, about life. It's the way you talk to yourself that is fueling this emotion. And, and the cool thing, the beauty of the human brain is that we learn new things about the brain, like the, the concept of neuroplasticity, the able, ability to create new neurons and new connections that weren't there before, creating new realities for yourself. And like the brain, it speaks in two languages, right? We spoke about one of them, which is reward. It loves dopamine and serotonin and also, like it, it fuel, it's fueled by reward and connections. Our brain makes connections. You know, I connect fire with heat, with food, with light, with warmth, with ouch. You know, so when when you're used to when you're, you're when you're used to certain language being as, you're associating with yourself, so let's say I'm such an idiot sometimes, right? And my brain is used to connecting that language with me. Fahad says he's such an idiot sometimes. He believes he's such an idiot. Mm -hmm. So if I start creating a new language, saying. I now believe that I am a limitless being that can learn whatever and I can get through whatever and I can learn from everything. I no longer believe that I am an idiot sometimes. I am How constantly do you do learning. Do you wake up and decide to say so, that to yourself? So, so yeah, so, so, no. so here's the cool thing about the brain, right? The brain notices things. Like for my clients, when I tell them, listen, how about the next session you come with a pencil and a pen? They're like, why a pencil and a pen? I say, because your brain knows the difference. Because your brain knows that a pencil is more temporary. So if you write things that you want to let go of in pencil, and you tell your brain, no, but I say, this, this, this in pen. And your brain starts noticing. Like, that's interesting. You're writing these thoughts that used to be yours, and now you don't want them to be yours anymore. I, um, in psychology, we call this a fixed mindset, the part of you that's negative and, and criticizing. So if you give that a name, I called mine Bob because there was an old Bill Murray movie called What About Bob, where he chases his uh, psychiatrist <laughs> into his vacation and makes his life hell. And uh, but he means well, you know. So my wife calls hers Peekaboo. So when you start creating a new folder in your head, right, uh -huh. in this new folder, you're putting all of the negative talk. You're saying, I say, for instance, Bob says I'm such an idiot. But I say... I'm learning all the time and I appreciate mistakes because they make me better and stronger at who I am. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, my uh, Bob says it hurts me when people talk about me behind my back, but I say people's opinions and judgments are none of my business. I give away my power when I react to things in a negative way. <laughs> you know, no, right. And saying that hers is called, El Feba. El Feba. <laughs> El Feba. <laughs> Some of the most amazing names I've had. Uh, one is Negative Nancy. One called hers Now What. Uh, one person called his King Lazy. Amen to that. <laughs> or King BLT. Lazy. 
Yeah. Yeah, King Lazy or B B L T, which stands for be like that. Why you, why you just you just be like that, you know? And the <laughs> idea is that we lovingly create a new folder in our heads. It's not about splitting personalities. It's about talking to the brain in the brain's language. Because mm. at first the language is I'm an idiot is the strong and prevailing language. There's no replacing language. When I say Bob thinks I'm an idiot, but I think I am limitless. So suddenly the, the I am an idiot gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And the language of I am capable, I can, I am enough gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Suddenly you are, you are wiring your brain to your benefit by just changing the language. Because when you realize that everything that's been bringing you down is a language you use with yourself and you just change that language, Imagine what will happen. Imagine a version of you that has zero negative talk. Wow, right? Wouldn't that be beautiful? That's the beautiful thing. It's possible. Maybe not to remove it completely, but to catch it as fast as you can so it doesn't have any power to let anything get you for more than half an hour. Would that be the first practice you advise to whoever is watching and suffers from depression? Would that be the first um, thing? trying to catch the negative self-talk? So catch yourself. This is, this is one. Of, so catch yourself not from a judging space, but from an observing space. Question it. One nice hack, life, like mind hack that I can share with the audience and whoever is listening, and you, of course, which has helped me a lot these days, is asking myself fact or opinion. I'm, I'm always clumsy. Fact or opinion? Well, Sounds like an opinion. Yeah. You know? <laughs> life is never, sure? is life never goes my way. Life never goes my way. Oh, really? Is that a fact or an opinion? Well, yeah. I guess that's an opinion. And that's the thing. That shit layer, that fixed mindset, that negative talk, it disguises itself as fact, but it's always an opinion. Yeah. I'm always big. myself. I'm ruthless. Well, up, up till now, up till now, fact or opinion. <laughs> and we all together, I would like anybody who's on this talk to suggest the name I should give to my own... Um, fixed mindset? Your, your fixed shit layer? Fixed mindset, negative <laughs> self-talk. I need help in terms of... Find me a really, really bad name, like something bad. Mm. Everybody's thinking now. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> too. I, I, I like playing this game. I think it it's, it speaks to me what you're saying, and I think like indeed, I think we go we went back to the when you said when you suffered from when you suffered from um, depression, you said mm. my brain hated me. Yeah, and I think that's factor exactly opinion, right? <laughs> factor opinion, my brain hates me. It definitely was not a fact, as <laughs> I found out. Uh, so this, uh, they're suggesting, why don't you take a minute, a, second, a few seconds, close your eyes, and imagine what first name comes to you to be your fixed mindset's name. We can do this yeah, together. Yeah, I'm going to ask her or him. So what's the first name that comes to you? It's called Norbert. Norbert, I love it. Bob, meet Norbert. Norbert, meet Bob. Hey, nice go. to meet you, Norbert. And right. just, just, just advice for people, uh, like, honestly, don't, don't, be, don't hate on that part of you. Don't even hate on the negative part of you. Because remember, its main purpose was to protect you. It may not do it the job that you want it to be or to do, but it is trying. You know, and you have to appreciate it. And we're not meant to let go of it with hate or anger or riddance. We're letting go of it with love and gratitude because it did keep us safe in more situations than we can imagine. We're just ready to take control of our life, to take the steering wheel and lead our life in a way that fills our heart and fills our purpose. Can I ask you in your own practice, I mean, can we have another hour? I want to talk <laughs> more with you. I, I mean, Sahad, we'll have to have another hour. We'll talk about something else. We definitely we'll have talk to talk about... again. For sure. I love talking with you and uh, I appreciate too, you sharing your platform for these kind of talks. It's really and important. I'm so grateful you're here and I mean yes. that very deeply. Um, yeah. Flo, Flo is Guy, your beautiful wife, she's sending me unconditional love to Norbert, Nora <laughs> as well. Bob and Norbert uh, are being thanked for being so negative but so obvious now because 
So this is a good one. So I want to talk about if anybody here has suffered from depression or is suffering from depression. I know there's no recipe, but I think it's so helpful when we are helpless to understand what are the steps to take. And so if anybody's listening, wants to, uh, to suggest what was the most helpful to them, thank you, Roman. She's grateful for the tribe talk and it was a brilliant talk, she says. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, and also, if very quickly, I can add, if anyone would like to understand what we, any of the things we talked about at a deeper level, please visit happyeveryday.today and yes. uh, try out a session. This is what I do for a living. I help empower people with this knowledge and different perspectives so that you can be your greatest savior and find your own superpowers. Yes. So that's the idea. I'm not leaving you now. I want to have some tips we always go above time anyway. So if you're not bothered, that time, <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Uh, I just want you to give us like kind of a root map of what can be done. I mean, obviously calling you and I, I want to address two things. First, I would like you to give us advice as to what are the first thing, like talking to Norbert and identifying this self negative chattering so it can dissolve and actually it can, what we were saying at the beginning of this talk, you can actually divide the, the real self to what you're not, i.e. your thoughts. And so that's the first, that's the first thing to, to do. I would like you to suggest more things that can be helpful. And then secondly, I would like you to explain to us how you deal with this in your practice and I mean, people can find you on Instagram here, but I would like to, for you to explain what is your um, treatment kind of roadmap. Of course. Sorry, my nose. Um, yeah. And uh, I'll explain it right now very briefly. Of course, on my website, there's an FAQ page, which explains at least the first seven sessions and exactly what I go through. So um, it first starts with identifying and understanding that you do have a fixed mindset. You know, to see that perspective, to understand and what its purpose that it's there to protect you, even though it's not really doing a good job at making you feel good, but that's its main purpose, to protect you, right? Mm. Then to name it, because like a very beautiful person in my life uh, said, name it to tame it, you know? And when you put a name to your fixed mindset, you begin to notice it better and you begin to disassociate that the, the language that doesn't serve you with you, right? Yeah. Um, and, and in the sessions, what I do is I, we go through different scenarios and we try to basically write down the complete MO, the complete language of your fixed mindset. So do you know what you're catching? Because sometimes your, your fixed mindset can be sneaky in the way, mm. you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? Uh, it pops up. And, uh, and, and after that, we go through, um, I, I briefly touched on them, the three irrational beliefs that are part of all of our pain and suffering. So that's knowing your fixed mindset at a deeper level. When you start understanding what belief system drives this language, you know, why yes. is it using this language? Is it because it's having an unrealistic expectation of life, of, it's, of yourself, of others? I'm not enough. I, I am not lovable. I'm not... Exactly. Upset. Whichever it is. Whether it's are you unfair, un, uh, fairly judging yourself, other people, or life. So you see which one it's tied to. You know, an easy way to do that is asking, act your opinion. And after that, you start going into what roles does your fixed mindset play? Does it play the victim role? Does it play the, the perfectionist role? Does it play, you know what I mean, uh, the pleaser role? And when you start yes. understanding the roles that your fixed mindset is playing the most, you're understanding its language, you're understanding the belief system behind it, suddenly you have a much clearer picture at what you're trying to catch. And you're starting to see the clearer picture of how that is not you, how there is a separation between this fixed mindset part of you and the true authentic you, the diamond in the middle. You know what I mean? So yeah. my, my greatest uh, advice for people is get in the habit of questioning yourself when it comes to the negative self-talk. And you will notice that all of your negative self-talk is based on assumptions. Hmm. All of your inner judgments towards yourself, others, and life are based on assumptions. More, more accurately, they're based on unrealistic expectations. And when you start seeing that your life decisions and the negativity is coming from unrealistic expectations and you naturally don't want to be an unrealistic person, you start seeing your life differently and you start choosing differently. You start choosing the better path. 
it's not an easy path, but it's a path that if you work on, it won't take you as long as you think to overcome things and to be a version of you that doesn't recognize the person who is watching this video today, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I kind of like what's also very, very major for me now at this stage of my healing journey and healing people and discussing on those tribe talks is that any illness and depression kind of even more obviously even are nothing but opportunities. And I know that it's easy to say when you've just, you know, uh, experienced something dramatic and the loss of and, and you know, it's, it sounds extremely insensitive, but it feels like this every time that illness yeah. and depression particularly are opportunities to turn things around, yeah. really. Of course. And um, uh, yeah. It yeah, we have to feel it to heal it. We have to feel. We have to feel these emotions we have to, to feel heal these it emotions. To heal it. There's no other. Like, there's no other way to do it. And no. but it's 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 how you're feeling it. Don't feel it with judgment. With so a lot of the things that we I associate like a lot of the pain that we have is because of memories of traumas of things that we we went through. You know, uh, situations in life. But are you the same person you were a year ago? Are you the same person you were six months ago? Are you the same person you were a month ago? Yet we are reliving the memories as if we're still that person who went through that memory. Mm -hmm. Even though we've actually went through a journey of, 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 of growth, of learning and stuff. But the memory is attached not to this age, it's attached to the previous age. To, to a person you almost don't, I'm sure you don't identify as that person as much as you do this person right now. That person's okay. a much different person than who you are now. You've learned so much. You've grown so much. Probably if you went through the same situation now than then, it would have been different. You would probably would have handled it or felt it differently. Maybe. You know what I mean? But the point is we are attached to previous versions of us. We Not that they don't matter. We experience the present using the past. Yeah. Not, not that it's irrelevant what's happened to us, but it's how we're experiencing the emotions instead of focusing on the lessons. Because the lessons were given to a different person, but you can still learn them today, you know, mm -hmm. as you. Yeah. But when you're just mem remembering them for the pain, then you are remembering as the past you, not as current you. You're not going back there in the past. That's what's beautiful about inner child healing. You know, when you visit your past self and as your current self. And you provide the love and the care that your past self wanted to know about, wanted to, wanted to hear, the things that they wanted to, to feel. And you provide that for them because you are disassociating. And the beauty about inner child healing is you're disassociating the emotional part of past you with current you. Nora you're coming saying, in as your higher self. Yeah. No, sorry. Nora is saying depression is actually a manifestation of being in the past rather than being present. And anxiety is the manifestation of being in yeah. the future. And it's Beautifully really said. Too. I mean, uh, I have met like people who are chronically depressed and one very close to me. And it seems like what is haunting is um, endlessly the regret of what happened in the past and the fear of what's to come in the, fu in the future. Yeah. yeah. That's paralyzing. That That's is, paralyzing. I'm sure. And, and again, and this is when spirituality comes. This is when we are not the mind and the body. And this is when we are the soul as well. It's like without the faith, you know, without yeah. somehow, I think it's very important. I, it might be sounding a bit woo-woo and abstract, but I think it's actually quite crucial. Without the humility to realize that we do not control we do not control, right? Well, we control, but not control out externally. We control internally. You know what I mean? That's what we control. We control how, we, how, how we react, how, how our emotions, our intelligence, our abilities. This we control it. that. This is it. It's, it's, it's us trying to control, thinking that we're trying to control things that technically are not within our control. That's the thing. A lot of people try to bring change and change their story, but they're too busy trying to control things that are technically not within their control. That's and they're it. forgetting the things that are within their control. That's it. 
the conversations I choose to have, the emotions I choose, to, the reactions I choose. And these the are all my I choice. To tell. Yeah. Mm. Well. <laughs> All right, so whoever is watching this video is, has had a good time, I'm sure. Thank you all for being there, for being here, sorry. You'll find Fahad as Happy Everyday Coaching. Uh, what is the website, Fahad? Because I love it. It's, it's happyeveryday.today. So please visit, <laughs> check out. There's a, there's a testimonial page of people who've try, uh, given a try. There's an FAQ page where I try to break down and explain my process because I love people understanding the journey that they're going through and where they're going. Yeah. And this is my life purpose. I quit my corporate career to do this full time. And this is, I, I believe in what I do. And I've already seen the changes in people. If you guys want to understand or go dig deeper into any of the topics we talked about today, this is, this is literally my bread and butter. And I would love to help you show you your, your, your superpowers, your mental and emotional That's superpowers. It. That's it. Regain the tools to reach down to this well that's full of of nurturing and water and Fahad will help uh, doing that. I might come and turn see into diamonds, Tur turn into diamonds. My pleasure. Everyone's welcome. And... Turning into diamonds. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you to all the people who are on this chat because you made it like really, truly alive, which is brilliant. Uh... Fahad, I'm sorry, but um, you will have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's no apology at all. It'd be my yeah, pleasure. We'll have to do things together, and for I sure. do the Ayurvedic diet, and you'll do the coaching or something like that. I think the universe will conspire to... somehow to put us together to do some good for people. Because, yeah, I really you know, hope yeah. so. I mean, I'm sure. So actually, facing <laughs> that, uh, you have um, what did I want to say? You have a retreat coming up, don't you? Yeah. Uh, actually, we have a retreat in uh, my wife and I. My wife's a yoga and Pilates instructor, and she's also a meditation instructor. And uh, we have a ret we do retreats regularly. And the next one is in Zanzibar at the end of October. Uh, uh, so this one, book. yeah. Gratefully, this one has been has been fully booked. Uh, oh. but we're doing them all the time. Um, I also do online workshops, uh, wherever you are in the world, my sessions, I do them virtually as well. And, uh, I will also, if you follow me, you will get news of any retreats, any things, any workshops that we do. And hopefully we get to see you all more. And, uh, I am grateful for all of you, everything. I'm grateful for you Ev, so much. Thank you so much for giving for allowing me to speak and hearing me out. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and knowledge in Ayurveda, which is always wonderful to hear. Thank and you. just thank you for the interaction, everybody. Uh, happy every day to everyone. Yes, same here. I think there's a lot of love and gratitude here. You yeah. just had a good time. Um, <laughs> whoever is uh, inclined to have more information because we touch upon a lot of really key principles and I think they're all very... Uh, thank you, Halia. I want to say thank you to Halia live here because Halia, not your wife, but Halia of Gaia because yeah. she is she's the one who was kind of... She kind of gave me the, the energy to start the Tribe Talks. So That's amazing. Well, thank you, Halia. That you, you started a beautiful thing in your friend and thank you for introducing us to if and uh, yeah, Rali also yeah. Is, a, is, a, is a wonderful yoga instructor, meditation instructor here. She does sound healing as well. So make sure and to reach out to her as well. And we are at our retreat. I mean, there's a whole tribe, a family of amazing people with, uh, and Roman and oh my God, this is beautiful. Okay, sorry for this. Mm. I'm, I'm back <laughs> in, in happiness thanks to you, Farad. I knew that would happen. And I mean that. And I just want to do another talk soon. Uh, good luck on the retreat. Have fun in Thank Zanzibar. Thank you so much. And, Thank you so much. And um, I haven't gotten enough of you. So I'm going to get you all actually from Saudi. Much love. <laughs> much love. Happy every day, everybody. Happy every day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.